Gentleman yields back her time. A gentleman uh, from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you so much for calling this hearing. Americans have heard about improper pandemic relief payments and the bad actors who took advantage. Um, there are also many folks to um, what uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Salib, was just talking about, folks in my own family um, who are, you know, not fraudsters, received incorrect overpayments and were very stressed receiving those letters, receiving those calls, figuring out what they need to do next. Um, these bad actors use the government's need to act urgency as an opportunity to claim taxpayer dollars meant for those who needed it the most. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, I, I want to talk really quick about trends and patterns. Have you, I mean, you've helped identify several individuals who have stolen and misused COVID relief money. Are these individuals usually pretty sophisticated fraudsters? We're seeing the range of fraud. Um, it was mentioned earlier about the Secret Service. We've worked with them on international uh, organized crime efforts. On the other hand, you have people who just, it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to get money. Some people, because they thought they really needed more money, because they were economically disadvantaged, doesn't excuse the fraud. Um, and other people who were billionaires or millionaires who decided to buy luxury yachts, Lamborghinis, we call them, we refer to them as Lamborghini cases sometimes. And people stealing the money and buying expensive cars, yachts, diamonds, et cetera, going on trips. Um, we have plenty of those cases, sadly, as well. And do you feel like the government was very clear in what would be a proper use and improper use of all the funds that people were requesting? Well, I think one of the challenges with the Small Business Administration programs was the lack of clarity on expectations. And we've heard in other programs that we've had hearings on and discussed with program administrators, the lack of clarity from the agencies on how to implement new programs, the lack of guidance, and that they, they struggled with states, localities, other entities that were getting grants and loans. It, it, that's something that also needs to happen with regularity. Are there patterns in their behaviors, the fraudsters, um, that make catching future ones easier to catch? You know, one, one of the things I've talked about is um, avoiding the perfect being the enemy of the good. There, there are plenty of hurdles we can put in place of people who try to engage in fraud. Um, and what we've seen over and over again, and I was formerly a prosecutor earlier in my career, if you put a hurdle in, or enough hurdles in front of people, um, you might not stop the most sophisticated fraudster. You might need even more uh, stringent efforts and guardrails, but you're likely to stop most people because when they first get the call or are told, um, you know, you, you triggered an alert, we want to talk to you, most people who know they're fraudsters drop it right there, right? They don't show up for the interview. And I've, again, compared it at the airport. If you know there's the magnetometer there, you're probably going to think before you try and walk through with a weapon, right? That doesn't happen with great frequency, fortunately. But if there's no magnetometer there, if it's like for many of these programs, just sign a form and say you're telling the truth and we'll give you the money, you get fraudsters lining up. Could I, could I add something really yes, quick? Yes, please. Um, you know, the Comptroller General testified several times during the pandemic that you know, GAO put the GAO fraud framework out over a dec almost a decade ago and agencies didn't implement the practices within. And one example, when you ask about these fraud cases during the pandemic, there was a case in California where an enterprising group of fraudsters applied for unemployment insurance on behalf of every prisoner in the California state penal system, and, and they got it. So it was you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of you know, obviously improper stolen um, unemployment insurance. When the California state auditor went back and looked, the state had never conducted a fraud risk assessment. Now, if these things are done well, as the GAO fraud framework clearly lays out, then the state of California would have at some point in that time prior to the pandemic asked but that would have been a fraud scheme. Somebody posing as a prisoner trying to get an unemployment benefit. And then they would say, how would we mitigate that? Well, we'd have access to prisoner data. Do we have access to prisoner data? We do not. So we see a gap. Now we're going to get access to prisoner data, and we've now closed that fraud scheme, that risk. And that's what's, you know, when, when, when Ms. Brown is talking about the importance of implementing the GAO fraud framework, that's really a, a real-world example, is if the state had done that, then they would have known they needed that access to the data prior to the pandemic. They would have gotten that data-sharing agreement in place, and that fraud scheme and that, those hundreds of millions of dollars wouldn't have been stolen. 
and that's also the importance of the states and the federal government working together mm -hmm. because California can then share its experience with, with all the other states and all the states can look for it. And to his credit, the um, Department of Labor IG in April um, put out a fraud alert about this and that was one of the, 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 the situations that they put states on uh, alert to. But just to add on to Mr. Horowitz, Horowitz's point with another example, the uh, retention tax credit program is an IRS um, program. And what they've done is they, they, they suspended the program and they put a pause on all of the folks that had filed uh, claims for this particular tax credit. And they ran analytics and they identified a number of them as um, likely fraud, and then they have had a category of like a higher risk level that they were uncomfortable with, with and then a lower level. And they also offered folks who'd file a claim an opportunity to withdraw their claim. Mm. Uh, and a number of people withdrew their claim because it's like if you, you know, IRS has now flagged it, so if this is problematic, we're gonna give you an opportunity to withdraw your return. So I think that is another uh, example of where an agency was proactive in preventing money from going out the door fraudulently. Well, thank you to the three of you for being here. I think, um, you know, something I'm really getting out of this is it's not that, uh, it's that we, we've res we have a ton of best practices, right, and, and use cases that we can use in the future. So that way the conversation isn't around not doing programs that are going to help the American people, especially in time of need, but making sure we do it in a better and more efficient way. Thank you. I yield back.